thou may be feared. The forgiveness you have given us makes us to fear you. Because then we know if we do anything after such a mercy, after such a forgiveness, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. But Father, we thank you because we are taught your fear. We are taught your, your, your reverence, the honor due to your name. All that remains is for you to help us never to forget it. And to always put you in that place, that special place, that merciful people ought to be, forgiving people ought to be. And indeed, no man who has ever lived, and no man who will ever live, can ever merit the reverence, the honor, the fear that you deserved. But we are praying as a church and as a people that we will not become like the Israelites to whom you are asking, if I be a father, where is my fear? You, you give sacrifice unto me. You give service to me. Go and offer the same to your governor. See whether he will take it from you. But, O oh Lord, those people with all that you spoke to them, they never quite learned the fear of God. And that's why many times you rejected them. We are praying, dear Lord, that you will teach us to fear you. Amen. Teach us to love you. Amen. Teach us to walk with you. Amen. Teach us to love you. Amen. Teach us to do your will. I am praying today that in a special way, every one of us, in a definite way, within this short time we have, will come into a place when the name of the Lord will strike the necessary reverence in our hearts, any time we draw near. Amen. Be with us and be with those who will join us later on. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. As you have seen in the program in your hand, we are speaking on foundation of acceptable service. Foundation of acceptable service. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28, that chapter of Hebrews, you know, is the chapter that talks about discipline of God. First of all, it has spoken about the uh, need to look, look unto Jesus as we are running the race that is set before us. And it tells us why we must run with patience and diligence. It tells us that in our running, there will be times when God, as a father, will a need to call us to correct us when there is need and he tells us that we should endure the chastening and the discipline of God as child to a father and then further down he changes the field first he gives us God as a father and we see that as a father he corrects his children he corrects his uh, sons and daughters and later on, it gives us another side of God, which, unfortunately, many gospel churches and Christian people don't know, or maybe they don't pay attention to. It gives us another side of God, which maybe many people who are serving God today don't really give attention to. It gives us another side of God, which forms the basis for acceptable sacrifice or service. It forms the foundation for acceptable service unto God. It gives us another side of God which if you don't know, your service can even turn to judgment. And that side of God is the side we are concentrating on in our study, in our message this morning. First, as I said, we are seeing, we see God here as a father. But he changes it now. And he tells us that this God is not just a father. He is the sovereign, the mighty, the great, the high, the holy God. And he tells us that in approaching him as a father, we approach him like children and he deals with us as with, with the tenderness of a father. But, as we are approaching, you know, the fatherhood of God talks about our inheritance in Christ. But this other side of God, the, master, the mastership of God, the, 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 over, the overseership of God, the, 
greatness of God, the administrative side of God, He brings God to us here, not as uh, a father, He brings Him to us as a mighty God. And while we see Him as a father, and that talks about our inheritance, this one talks about our duty. This one talks about our reverence for Him, our fear of Him, that is deserved. Because it's not just a father, you know, it's like you find somebody who is uh, a policeman in the family he has a wife and children and in the house his wife and his child they can approach him at any time they can do anything they like to him uh, but when he gets on the major road and he stands there controlling traffic his father may be driving the car this time he's no longer his son he's now a representative of the government his wife, whom he loves, may be riding that car. The moment he stands there, that woman knows, although this is my husband, but he's in a different capacity now. It's like a judge in the a law court. At home, the child is his child. But if that child comes to the court, while the court is in session, maybe to see the father or to do something there, he has to respect the office of that father if the court says everybody rise up, that child has to rise up. If the court says everybody sit down, that child has to sit down. And if the court says nobody should talk, that child has to keep quiet. Because although this is my father, I can climb his neck while we are told. Now he's a different person now, in a different capacity. And I give him the honor due. Here is the foundation for acceptable service. Here is the basis for acceptable service. And please. If you want to serve God for long, pay attention today. If you want to serve God and you want to endure in Christian service, then you need to pay attention today because you will see someone here who has a great, great lesson to teach us. They call his name Moses. Uh, I told you we are reading verses 28 and 29, but you will see that from verse 18. He says, You are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and then he mentions the name of Moses in verse 21. And then he talks on and talks on and talks on. Then he gives a conclusion in verse 28. He says, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. This other side of God is what? I want to call your attention to today. This, our God, we are told, is a loving Father. But at the same time, this, our God, is a consuming fire. That consuming fire there does not mean the fire that destroys. No. Or, uh, uh, practically, uh, primarily, that consuming fire is not supposed to destroy, provided you don't cross your boundary. Provided you don't go beyond your, your limit. Provided you stay where he wants you to stay as a servant of God. That consuming fire will not consume you. It's just there in case you go beyond your boundary. And this is the other side of God, which I want to press on your mind. Myself, I'm trying to understand more of this now. To serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This thing... And we are told about Moses there, and that is a very, very instructive reference. That's that verse 21 that talks about Moses. Now, to understand that, uh, let's go now to Revelation chapter 15, and we'll start from verse 1. Revelations, uh, Revelation chapter 15, and verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, they stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now I go to verse 3 where I'm going. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Take note of that. 
who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Forget verses 1 and 2. It's just like a prelude to what I want to share with you. But in verse 3 we are told that some people, they had conquered the, the image, they had conquered the beast, they had not taken the number of his name, and so they were redeemed. And we are told that they were singing. We are told that the song they were singing, it was composed originally by Moses. We don't know where, because if you see all the uh, songs that Moses uh, wrote, by the way, Moses had many songs. There was a whole chapter, I think, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, is entirely the song of Moses, the man of God. There was another song he taught later. We have quite a number of songs, uh, you know, coming from that man of God. And I challenge you, go and study those songs. We'll do a little of those studying today. But you find here, these people were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. What was that song of Moses? Of course, you know, songs are composed by people depending or based on their knowledge or their revelation or their inspiration at a point in time. Think of the song we just finished singing now. You know that kind of a song. Is, uh, it must be coming from a kind of inspiration, some revelation that somebody had, and he put it in song. Now, this song we are singing, we are reading here, was a song of Moses, and it's telling us about the mind of Moses, the knowledge of Moses, the understanding Moses had about God. The revelation Moses had about God. He's telling us about what Moses knew about God. And what was it? He says, great and marvelous are the works of God. Of course, you know, it's not only Moses that spoke about the great and the marvelous works of God. Have we forgotten Psalm 19? The heavens declare the glory of God. David also spoke about that. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways. Well, it's not only Moses uh, that knew that the ways of God are just, the ways of God are true. Abraham said, Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Then he says, Thou king of saints. Not the father now, the king of saints. Of course, not only, uh, not only uh, the, uh, Moses has knew that. Other people knew that. Hosea knew that God is the king of saints. He spoke about that in chapter 14. Now he says, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Maybe that is one thing. Maybe that is one knowledge that Moses had about God that probably no other person in the entire Old Testament had that knowledge. Maybe the only person that came close to that revelation was David. But maybe David not, did not even know as much about God in this area as Moses. So, if Moses has a song to teach us about God, then we are wise if we listen. If Moses has a message for us about God, then it is our wisdom if we pay attention. Other songwriters sang about God, but their singing about God came from lesser revelation than what Moses had. For example, Asaph spoke about God. Heman spoke about God. Even David sang about God. But please, the revelation of God that Moses had was different and maybe higher than all those people put together. A song that Moses gives here is about the greatness of God, the majesty of God, the mighty works of God. What revelation did Moses have before he wrote this song about God. Look at Exodus chapter 33 for a moment. Exodus chapter 33 and in verse 11. Exodus chapter 33 verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But the servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now we know that uh, this was a man. The Bible says God spoke with him face to face. As a man speaks unto his friend. That was Moses. 
If such a person has a son to teach us about God, I think it is our wisdom if we listen. In Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. And in verse 9. Sorry, chapter 12 verse 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. And I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of God shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. That was the Moses we are talking about. Here was a man that had a relationship with God. God defended him. This man knew God. He saw God face to face. If he has a song to teach us about God, that man must have an important lesson. And we had better listen. We had better pay attention. This man did not hear of God through preaching. He saw God face to face. This man did not have a second hand a revelation of God. This man had first hand revelation of God. And if he wants to teach us a song about God, about the greatness of God, about the majesty of God, about the mighty works of God, I think Moses should know. He should know. That's why we should pay attention. Why did I say Moses should know? Of course you know in Psalm 103 and verse 7. Psalm 103 and verse 7. In Psalm 103, you see, it talks about, Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all thy benefits, who forgives all thy iniquities, who heals all thy diseases, and so on and so forth. That's the benefit of a child of God. He heals thy diseases, he does miracles for you, so on and so forth. That is the benefit of a child of God. In verse 7, he tells us something different from a child of God. He tells us about the servant of God. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts, unto the children of Israel. He tells us here that God made known his ways. That's why Moses could say, just and true are thy ways. He knew that way of God. God showed his ways to him. And he could talk with confidence, this is the way of God. Just and true are thy ways, thou king of all saints. God made known his ways unto Moses. Moses knew God and so he could write a song about God. Now, in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, now Moses should know. If he tells us, who will not fear thee, O God, that's part of his song, Moses should know. Because if you read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, for ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched. And had gone with fire, known to blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that had entreated that the word should not be spoken unto them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart, and so terrible, so fearful was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Here it tells us why Moses said, Who will not fear thee, O God? The reason is because at the beginning of his ministry, when he wanted to start leading the children of Israel, God told him, Get these people together. And at that time, some things happened. This is the summary of it here in Hebrews. There was blackness, there was darkness, there was fire, there was tempest, there was voice, there was trumpet. It was such a fearful sight. In fact, the Israelites could not stand. They had to run away. And they told Moses, you go and meet God. We cannot come near this God. The sight was so fearful and terrible. And when they were running away like that, God said, Moses, come up here. And when Moses was coming up himself, he didn't tell the children of Israel that himself was afraid. Now he's telling us we're having by revelation, given to Paul the Apostle, that at that time, Moses himself, he said, I exist.
exceedingly fear and I quake. Although himself, he was telling the people at that time, fear not, fear not, himself was almost dying of fear. Because he saw God. Look at Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Sometimes, uh, you know, leaders and pastors, sometimes you tell the people, you speak good words to them, you tell them God is in control, fear not. But sometimes you yourself, you have serious fear in your heart. Thank God you don't tell the people, because if you do, then they will say, Pastor is fearful, then we are all dead. Moses was afraid, and he had cause to be afraid, because he saw a side of God which he had never seen before. In Exodus chapter 19, and in verse 16, and it came to pass, on the third day in the morning, that there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud upon the mount, and a voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp, what did they do? They trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part, distant part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded loud, long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, Ah, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. For thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spoke unto them. That was the thing that Hebrews was talking about, but that's not the end. Go to chapter 20 and in verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and they stood afar. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. That's what I was telling you about. Now, later, uh, you know, he didn't tell the people himself that he also was afraid. But by the Spirit, God spoke to the writer of the Hebrews and says, At that time, Moses himself, he said, The sight of the lightning, the thunder, the trumpet, the smoke, the fire, the noise, everything, the, the sight was so fearful and terrible that myself, I not just, I didn't just fear, I, I quake. You know what, you know earthquake? That's how you get earthquake. You know when you see earthquake, it, uh, it turns buildings upside down, it opens the ground, a lot of things happen. Moses said an earthquake was taking place inside my heart at that time. Even though he didn't tell the people. And then the people said, well, you go and meet God. This God, we cannot come near this God. And Moses told the people, he told God, he said, they cannot come near. God said, go and make sure they will not come near because if they come near at this time, it could be dangerous. That's the side of God I'm talking about. And only Moses was called to that place. Of course, he was the leader. And the people, they ran away. Even where God told them to stand, they even gave more gap. They gave more distance. He said, he said we should stand there, but we'll move back a little bit more. And they told Moses, you come and speak to us. If God speaks to us in this condition, we are going to die. And then in verse 21, Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. That's why I told you, Moses should know. When he said, Who will not fear thee, O God? That's in Revelation chapter 19 and verse uh, 4 that I read to you. Who will not fear thee, O God? Moses should know because he was one who knew how dreadful, how fearful, <laughs> how awesome God is. 
brothers and sisters, that was why Moses served God for long. He was a man who, in spite of service, in spite of ministry, he retained that fear of God all through. Not the type of fear of God I'm talking about now. It's not the type of fear of God that all believers should have. You know, the fear of God, the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God that keeps you from sin. That's, that's the, for every believer. This time I'm talking about this fear of God that makes your service acceptable to God. Moses, he never lost that fear. And that's why he served God for long. What he saw, what he knew, what he saw at that time, Moses never forgot. Uh, that's why it says, Who will not fear thee, O God? If you want to have acceptable service, uh, you start acceptably. If you want to continue your service acceptably and finish your service acceptably, beware of familiarity with God. This is the problem with many people who serve the Lord. As we begin the service of God, we begin in trembling. We begin with carefulness. We begin with caution. We begin with that awesome reverence for God. But as we go on in the service and we continue and we get used to the world, there, must, there may be this uh, dangerous familiarity with the world. Uh, you both of us who are pastors, we are all pastors here, you know what I'm talking about. That you become familiar with the work and you fami become familiar with God or known to you. And then uh, it may bring problems. That was why Moses, all the time, he constantly cultivated this reverential fear of God in his service. I'm afraid I would not like to talk about the only time he forgot that thing. And that felt problem for him. He never got out of that problem. But uh, I will not talk about that today. Let's just look at this. When God told Moses, go back to the people, go and warn them. Tell them not to peep. Tell them not to peep into the boundary that we have made around the mountain. They should not peep because God knew the Israelites. They could say, let me see what is even happening in that place, by the way. He said, go back and tell them. They should not peep inside. They should not gaze. They should not try to look. At that time, Moses was wondering, is this necessary to go and tell the people anything? God said, go and tell them. He said, they will not do it. We have made boundary. God said, go back and tell them. In fact, God had to literally drive Moses out to go back and do that task. He took the death of Nadab and Abihu for Moses to know the importance of that instruction. Because you know that Nadab and Abihu, later when they were consecrated, and then they were priests uh, with their father, later on when they got near the, not even the mountain now, not even the lightning and thunder and smoke and fire now, just the altar, silent altar. You know what happened to them, and Moses himself knew in Leviticus 10, they were struck dead. The men of Beth Shemesh, you remember, when the ark was coming back from Philistine, and it came to their coast, and they were glad, and they brought down the ark from the oxen that, you know, uh, brought the ark, and they killed the oxen, they made sacrifice unto God, that was okay. They touched the ark, that was okay, because God understood that there was no way they could, they would not touch the ark, since there was no Levite around, and the ark was just coming back from Philistine after spending uh, some time in that place. And so God knew that these people, they couldn't but touch the heart. God permitted them that. You remember? When Uzzah did it later, you know what happened. I'll come to that shortly. But God allowed them and they touched the heart. And then they went a shade too far. Then they opened it. By the way, what is even inside this box? You see, it's that thing I'm talking about. When you get into the work of God and you are serving the Lord as a pastor, as a zonal leader, as a coordinator, as a minister, as whatever capacity God puts you, as you go on in service, go on in service, go on in service, a time may come when you are used to the world, you are used to the ministry, you are used to the service, and you get to a point that you lose that fear of God, and whatever service you do after that time may be in problem. That's why those people God said, must go and warn them. Turn them back. And tell them not to come near. And then... When Nedab and Abihu was killed, then Moses knew how serious this matter was. That's why in, in Revelation that I read to you, go back there now, maybe you now understand why it was the song of Moses. And of all the songs of Moses, this was the only one that God deemed fit for it to be sung in heaven. That's why I picked that song. 
There are many songs of Moses. This is the only, the only one that God thinks fit to remind the angels in heaven. <laughs> Think about it. To remind the angels in heaven about these things in Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways. Thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou, thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. That was in heaven, singing. Who will not fear thee, O God? Because just at this time, in verse 1, it was time for God to bring his angry judgment upon the whole world. The seven last plagues were going to be brought out upon the world. And just before those plagues will be unleashed upon the world, we are told that the angels began to, it's like they were singing the praises of God. It's like they are saying, God, what you want to do, we know you deserve to do it. It's like, you are, it's like somebody wants to go for a fight. And before he goes for a fight, they begin to sing his praises. They begin to sing his praises. And what are they singing? Who will not fear thee, O Lord? That's why, my brothers and sisters, as we serve the Lord, as we serve God, we need to obtain grace to serve God with reverence and godly fear because our God is a consuming fire. And if the song of Moses talks about the fear, the dread, the reverence, the honor, the awe with which we should hold the Almighty God, then we had better pay attention. Moses spoke with God some time ago in Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33 and in verse 11. At this time in the life of Moses, the Israelites were in rebellion and Moses was having fellowship with the Almighty God. At this time, he was discussing with God. That man had a relationship with God, you know. And if you are drawn near to serve the Lord, a woman leader, youth leader, pastor, evangelist, house leader, whatever task you are given, will you please cultivate, before you go to that service, this fear of God, reverence that is due God, the honor that is due God. Remember, I'm not talking about the fear of God that every child of God must have. I mean the kind of fear of God that will not make you to go to sin. I'm talking about the fear of God that only servants of God ought to know and ought to have. In Exodus chapter 33, you find here, Moses was discussing. You may be looking for me to give you points. I will not give points in this, this message. In, Hebrew, in Exodus chapter 33 and in verse 11, And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face, as a man speaks unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But the servant Joshua, the, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses spoke unto the Lord, See, thou seest unto me, bring up these people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send unto me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I find grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. I told you, God showed his ways to Moses. That man, he said, God, I have been walking with you all these years, but show me your way now. Show me in a way you have never shown me before, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in, my, in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. He said, show me your way. But that's not all he asked for. You will see what again he asked for. He said, show me your way. And in verse 20, verse 14, And he said, God said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry, not up, carry us not up end. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, how and thy people, for all the people that are upon the face of all the earth? And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. He first of all said, God, show me your way. God said, no problem about that. 
Then he said, God, I know your way, but I want more. Show me your glory. And God said in verse 14, 19, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face. I have a problem with that. Didn't the Bible say that he spoke with God face to face? How come? God told Moses, he said, Moses, that thing you are seeing that you say we are talking face to face, that's not actually me. There's a thick veil that covers my face. He said, you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back part, but my face shall not be seen. That man, that's why he feared God. And if you are going to serve the Lord, serve God the way you should, you need to fear the Lord. In chapter 34, God fulfilled his promise to Moses. You can put down from verse 1, but I'll just go to verse 4. And he healed two stables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning, and he went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tables of stone, and the Lord descended in the cloud. And he stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. This was where Moses got his song, the song that he sang to God. He proclaimed before him the name of the Lord, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Remember, just and true are thy ways. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the fourth, third, and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth. Even the back part he could not look at. And he worshipped. That's Moses. And that's the man who gave us that song. If you check his other song in Deuteronomy chapter 32, his prayer in Psalm 90, you will say, this man, he knew the fear of God. So I could serve God for long. And what I'm trying to press on you today, my brothers and sisters, is this reverence with which we ought to hold God and hold the things of God. We are in danger of just holding the work of God with some casualness. We are in danger of handling our relationship with God with some casualness. Especially, you have served the Lord one year, five years, ten years, twelve years, fifteen years. If you don't learn the lesson that Moses learned, a time may come, maybe for some of you, maybe it has come, where you lose the reverence, the awe, A-W-E, with which you should hold the Almighty God and the things that pertain to God. And then we are not careful. We approach the work of God and even the God himself with some kind of familiarity, with some kind of, I knew you before, with some kind of, we have done it together before, and not with the normal reverence and honor, fear, that we ought to approach God. And we who are under grace, we are the people who have that problem. Somebody will hear the message I'm preaching today and will say, this looks like Old Testament theology. This kind of thing that fear pastor is talking about. Are we not children of God now? Are we not under grace now? Do we not have unconditional access into the presence of God now? You ask me those questions and I answer that exactly is the problem. The church of today needs a restoration of the fear and the reverence that is due to God, both in our relationship with God and in our service for God. We are in danger of over-familiarity with God. We are in danger of over-familiarity with the work of God. We are in danger of over-familiarity in our relationship with God. And that danger manifests in the way we handle His things, 
his service is named with a kind of definite casualness. Are we not in danger of the sons of Abinadab already? In First Chronicles chapter 13, First Chronicles chapter 13, and in verse 1, And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation, If it seem good unto you and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel and with them also to the priests and the Levites which are in their cities and suburbs that they may gather themselves unto us and then let us bring again the ark of our God to us for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul and all the congregation said that they will do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people so David gathered all Israel together from Shihor to Ophigis even unto the entry of Hema to bring the ark of God from Kiajah Jerry and uh, the, the, you can read down, we'll come back to that later in verse 7. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. Here is the story. The ark was captured by the Philistines. And eventually God troubled the Philistines, the ark came back. When it came back, and God disciplined the men of Beth Shemesh because of their undue familiarity with the ark, which represented the presence of God, then everybody was afraid. Rest. He was given instruction. He was sanctified to keep the ark, verse 2, and it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kajajeri, that the time was long, for it was how many years? Twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. After the Lord. Twenty years is a long period of time. A lot of things can happen in twenty years. None of us probably was in this town 20 years ago. So, after 20 years, within those 20 years, a lizard that was sanctified to take care of the ark, maybe he died, we don't know what happened to him. Maybe he traveled somewhere, I don't know what happened to him. Maybe, we don't know, but he was no longer there. By the time we get to First Chronicles chapter 13, when they were going to bring the ark back to the house of God, Eliezer was no longer the one handling the ark. He was the one sanctified. He was no longer handling the ark. The people that were handling the ark, maybe they were not instructed well. Maybe they were not taught well. Maybe they were not given the proper word. And so, in First Chronicles chapter 13, you find Uza and Ahio. They were the people taking care of the ark now. And uh, you will see that familiarity in the handling of the ark. You will see that kind of, uh, there's no big deal about it. In the handling of the ark, First Chronicles 13 verse 7, they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio, they drove the car. They were the people taking care of the ark. They were the people that were ministering to the ark when Eliezer was no longer there. And now in their own tongue, they made a mistake. Nobody told them, this is your boundary, this is your limit, this is how far you should go, this is how far you should not go, this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do, this is how to move with God, this is what you must not go beyond this boundary. They didn't know it. Brothers and sisters, that is a very instructive lesson. This is why when we want people to become workers, we should properly give them ex proper training not as to their serving alone, but as to their lives. Eliezer had proper training. So, all his 20 years, we don't know how many years he served, all his years, no problem. But this Uza, this Ahayo, this Johnny just come, that were handling the ark, they didn't know what was proper. And that's why, as we come to it later, you will see. Uza touched the ark, and God struck him Dead. That's why when we have people who are workers, at the very beginning, let us teach them, the work of God is not child's play. The work of God is not a, uh, 
It's just ordinary house fellowship. What's special about that? Ordinary children church. Ordinary youth work. Well, I'm just an ordinary house leader. I'm just a, a zone leader. There's no big deal about it. I am not the overall pastor. There is not anything special. It's just a, I'm just a, a district coordinator. And I don't have... When you are saying just, 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 just like that, and you're handling the work of God like that, and you're handling your relationship with God like that, well, I'm just a woman leader. I'm just a youth worker. And you don't reverence God. You don't approach that every day of service. You say, God, I fear you. God, how should I do this work? God, teach me. I don't want to cross my boundary. I don't want to sin. I don't want to go against you. I don't want to disobey. I don't want to uh, run ahead of you. Just tell me what to do. Without that kind of attitude in serving God, you may cross your boundary. You may forget the fear and the honor and the reverence that ought to be given to God while you are serving God. And so you find in First Chronicles chapter 13, because uh, Uzzah and Ahio took over from Eliezer, maybe they knew nothing of the reverence God should be held in, or maybe that reverence, maybe they knew it, it wore off over the years. This danger I'm talking about is not for those who have just started serving God. Do you remember how you were when you first started? When you were, you wanted to lead your house fellowship? You remember how you used to do it? I'm not talking about the skill, I'm talking about the attitude of heart. I'm talking about your, your sense of, hey, God, help me. You go back and pray again. When they say, okay, it's time for house fellowship now, and the people have gathered, you, while they are singing song in your heart, you are saying, God, how yeah, will I do this work today? When they gave you the first side of scripture class to teach, you remember? The first time they gave you the side of scriptures, you said, go. You fasted the whole of that week, maybe. But if you didn't do that, that's what happened to me. The first time they said, come and do Bible study or something, I said, Bible study. How will I say it? What will I say? How will I do it? I lost my appetite. Prayer, God, how will I do this thing? You look at the outline again. You read all the things. You cram everything. You, you know, because you, how, how will I do this work? You trembled. And even when you are preaching or doing the Bible study, when you finish, you say, God, well, I don't know what I've done, but God, I, I hope I've done what you wanted me to do. You are afraid good fear. But you know, over time, so do it again, do it again, do it again. If you are not careful, a strange casualness may enter into your service, that you now become casual, formal, in the service of God. And you don't hold that service of God with a serious hand, it deserves again. And so if you are going to preach to 10 people, oh, you say, well, it's just 10 people. After all, I've preached to 2,000 people before. And if you are going to teach study the scriptures, it's not night study scripture after all. I've preached in retreats before. And if you are going to uh, maybe give announcement, you say, announcement? Me? That I, I mean, I'm a preacher. I've been doing all these things. What's announcement? And if they say, well, now come and help us and speak to the little children in the children's church. You say, children, I'll be preaching to uh, adults and elderly people. So t children will be a walkover. When you have that attitude in service, casualness in service it has a lot of offshoots of course you will not pray again for the service that you want to render of course you will not consult god again you will not seek guidance from god again you will not approach god again and say god teach me what to do you will be self-sufficient for the work because i know how to do it i said i don't want to mention moses because you know we preachers we talk about it as if it's our equal. It's not our equal, but uh, you know that was the only time Moses had problem. It's just that time that he, he forgot. Maybe he forgot. And then he said something. He behaved in a kind of way. You know, before Moses would tremble. Moses would bow down his face to the ground. God will say, get up now. Go and talk to the people. He will say, God, are you sure I should go? They will stone me. God said, don't worry. I'll take care of it. That man will tremble and tremble and tremble. He started trembling from on Sinai. He never stopped trembling until the day that he said, Here now you rebels. Must we bring you water out of the rock? God said, Come here, Moses. You are becoming too audacious. You are becoming too bold. You are becoming too confident. God, I'm sorry. Well, in any case, sorry about it. No, God, please. And he said, No. Because, you know, God wanted that man to keep that fear. That fear of God. And that's why that man is served God beyond his generation. You want to serve God? 
you will not just be doing the work casually and approaching God as if God is our equal. Is God my equal? Is He your equal? It's not anybody's equal. That fear, reverence, that awe ought to characterize our service. That's the time that we can serve God reverentially, acceptably, without fear. That's the time our service can really be. God will look at it and will say, This man is not having confidence in himself. In Psalm 65, Psalm 65 and verse 4. Psalm 65 and verse 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. David said, you know the blessed man? The man that God chooses and God allows and permits to approach unto him. Moses was one of such blessed people. You, my brothers and sisters and myself, were some of those blessed people whom God permits. He chooses us. Not because we are skillful, not because we are educated. There are people who are more educated than we are in this world. We are not the best educated people here. At least, even those of us who are professors here, you are not the first professor in this world. So, there are better people, and there are higher people, more skillful people, much more brilliant, intelligent people. But God chooses you and me. And He says, approach me, come near me. He gives us the privilege to come near him in service, in prayer, in singing, to enter the altar area as a choir member, or as a youth worker, or as a children's church, or as a pastor, or as a, an evangelist, or as whatever work you are doing for God at the moment. Blessed are you. You are chosen of God, and you are permitted by God to approach unto him. But let that blessed man be careful. Let that blessed man walk tremblingly. You remember? God told Moses, remove the shoe from your feet. Where you are approaching unto is holy ground. We need this knowledge, this reverence in our service, brothers and sisters. Especially over the years, as we go on and go on, we become bold. We become audacious. We become confident. We become used to it. We become used to God. And when we become used to God like that, you're on dangerous ground. If you know God, if you know leadership, you know, some people, they like to be familiar with their leaders. If you are wise, you will not choose that path. It's not good to be familiar with your leader. Too familiar, I mean. I'm not saying you run away from him. I'm not saying you look at him from a distance. But make up your mind and let there be a gap. <laughs> that was what Moses knew. He made a gap. Let this man draw you, or God draw you, as close as he wants you to be. If you decide to move close, move close, move close, you will not fa familiarity breeds contempt. And contempt breeds death. That's what happened to Uza. Familiarity bred contempt, and contempt bred death. Well, in the New Testament today, we don't die physically. But God can just look at that person and say, so you think we are equals now? So you think we are the same, we are gang now? And God will just withdraw from you and stay afar off. Because he behoves the proud man from where? Afar off. He will move away. And he will keep his distance. Well, he does that in mercy to you because if he moves close to you, he can just destroy you. And so God wants us to recognize this reverential fear in the service of God. I want to emphasize what I've said again and again. I'm not talking about the fear of God that every child of God should have. If you are a child of God, you will fear God, you will not go into sin. You fear God, you will not sin. You will not commit fornication, you will not lie. You will not steal. You fear God, you will not, uh, you will not do evil. You fear God, you will, not, uh, you will not do anything that the word of God goes against. That's good for a child of God. But I'm talking about the reverence, the honor, the fear, 
the dread with which God Almighty deserves to be held by all those who move near Him. I want to talk to you, pastors. You need to cultivate this reverence, this fear, this awe regularly in your life. I round off the message by teaching you how to cultivate it. Because when you don't know how to cultivate this, it's easy to escape you. It's easy to get lost on you. It's easy to just become something, to, something you don't uh, give attention to. It's very, very easy. And so, how do you cultivate this reverential fear of God? And you go against casualness in your life, in your ministry? Very simple. Number one is self repudiation self repudiation that means you repudiate yourself you deny yourself not self deny actually you look at yourself you throw self confidence into the mouth self repudiation is the opposite of self confidence you lose that confidence in yourself you lose that can do attitude i can do i can yes i can do all things with christ the true christ has strengthened me but this self-repudiation huh, is the opposite of self-confidence you lose it and that's what drives you to god all the time you know the man that is always saying god i don't know how to do it god i don't know what to do god i don't know what next to do that kind of man will not make mistake that kind of man will, he will know that God is the one that teaches me what to do. That kind of man will not lose the fear of God because as he's coming out of that closet, he's going to tell himself, I just met with God now. So there will be that self-repudiation that drives you into the closet to God all the time. Even when you know what to do, you think you know what to do, that thing will still cause you to go back and check up from God again. When you lose that self-confidence, that's the beginning of cultivating a permanent fear of God in your life. Because let me tell you, people lose the fear of God. Listen, we lose, look at the cycle. You lose the fear of God because you are not close to God. And you are not close to God because you became too familiar with God. That's the cycle. First of all, you become used to God. You become used to Him. You know when you become used to someone? You can predict Him. You can think. You can put you onto this is what you can do, this is what you cannot. Because you have been together for a long time. Many of you now, for example, can predict me. You know what I can do. You know what I cannot do. You know what I can say. You know how I can do things. Because you have been together for, for long. The same way, when you have been together with God for long like that, you can become used to God. And that your becoming used to God makes you to become less dependent on God. That's the cycle. And because you are not dependent on God, you are not going to pray again. You are not seeking God again. You are not asking Him for guidance again. When they give you, maybe we have a retreat and they say, uh, you are going to do seminar. To help us take a seminar this time. Oh, well, it's a seminar. Uh -uh. That one is work over. Because uh, maybe pastor just wants to try other people this time. Because, you know, uh, uh, they, they, we, I mean, I was, I used to preach. But maybe God, you know, I don't understand pastor. He's trying to develop new leaders. So he wants those other people to also test the pulpit and preach. But uh, the seminar, he just gave me so that I will not, the people will not think I'm under discipline. So you approach that seminar with that attitude of, this is a small thing. And so you don't pray. You don't go before God and say, God, see, how do, I, how do I do this thing? What do I do now? Look at the topic they gave me. What, what do I do? How do I undo? Oh, he says, it's just ordinary seminar. That is the beginning of the danger I'm warning you against. When you get to that point where you are used to it, then, no prayer, you don't seek God. Then you approach that work, and uh, you just go and teach that thing and god looks at your attitude men are looking at what you are speaking god is looking at your attitude in, in speaking your attitude in that service you say okay this person is becoming too audacious okay this person is becoming bold 
And if God, if you are one of the people God loves, He will permit something to happen that will make you to lose your self-confidence. He will let something happen to you, not sin. Something that, you know, it deals with different people in different ways. That will make you to know that you are nothing, you don't know anything. If you are one of the people He loves, if He knows that you have a good heart, it's just the devil playing pranks on you, He will help you. But if He knows that this one, He will stand back and be looking at you, and then the next time, you know, you become so bold, you know, you are, it's like you know what to do. And even when you're asking God, even when Moses was uh, asking God, God, these people are about to stole me, God said, he bowed his face as he used to do before. God said, get to take the rod, go and speak to the, he didn't hear the instruction. He didn't, he didn't hear, because if he had, he wouldn't have done what he did. He was just there. The moment he got up, anger was in his heart. What he had decided to do before he went to meet God. That's what he went to do. We all have done it before. God says, speak to the rock. He didn't hear. So he just went and just beat the thing. Although water came out, but he suffered for it. And so when you are like that, you lose that reverence for God that will make you to say, God, are you, you say I should do it? He said, yes. Look at Gideon. At the beginning, he, he said, God, water on the wool, and then uh, the, uh, the ground dry, God did it. He said, God, I want to be sure again. Ground dry and water on the wool. Although we castigate him, we say, uh, that man was uh, putting out a fleece to God. When it comes to serving God, my brother, put fleece out properly. Not when you are wanting to know will of God in marriage and uh, those decisions of a Christian. When it comes to serving God, check up again. You can never check up too much. And then uh, Gideon checked up and checked up, but later, you know what the Bible says? That man became used to God, and so he just made an idol for the people. He said, we don't need to go to God again. This is an idol. This is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And uh, that man made an idol for the people. My brothers and sisters, when you become too close to God, too used to God, the result is that you become less dependent on God. Do you see that? You would think that if you become used to someone, you become more dependent on him. But no, when you become too used to God, you become less dependent to, on him. And when you become less dependent on him, you don't go to him for guidance and prayer, for leading, even for any service you want to do. And when you become like that, then you lose your reverential fear of God, which is the foundation of acceptable service. You see the cycle now? And I don't know what stage you are in, in your own life, in that cycle. Maybe you have entered that cycle already. If you have not, I, I envy you. I did. Thank God. You know, it's good. God calls you, calls you back, calls you back. Makes you to know that you need Him. You can't do anything without God. And if you have, call yourself back. That's why we are in leaders meeting. That's why we are in leadership forum. That's why the messages you are hearing here is for your life, ministry. If you have entered that cycle, less dependence, much used to God, and therefore less, you know, less seeking God. And when you get to that point, you have got into self-confidence. You know what to do. But that's the first thing you should deal with. Self-repudiation as against self-confidence then too you will have a constant meditation on the majesty and the sovereignty of God constant meditation one the majesty two the sovereignty of God what does that mean majesty speaks of his greatness sovereignty speaks of his ability to stand alone without anyone in the world. Do you know that God is the only one in the whole heaven and earth who can stand, who does not depend on anybody to exist? The angels, they depend on Him to exist. Even Christ, when He came into this world, He depended on the Father for His existence. That's why He said, I can of my own self do nothing. And then the apostles, and then all men, no one on earth, for without me, Jesus said, ye can do nothing. But when you meditate constantly, number one, on the majesty of God, the greatness of God, His mightiness. Then number two, on His sovereignty, the fact that God is sovereign, 
and it is in mercy that he condescends to human level that will keep you all the time remembering i need to fear this god he can do this thing without me but he brings me in for his glory and so that keeps you remember in remembrance all the time in your approach to God in your dealing with God you will not become you will you will you know you you give him a gap you will fear him you see this God is to be feared that's why Moses said what he said I challenge you go and read uh, go and read uh, the life of Moses from beginning to the end all his relationship in Exodus in Leviticus in Numbers in Deuteronomy his walk with God go and read it you will see a man it's like he was always walking on tiptoes with God. That's why that man lasted long. Now, in uh, the third thing that you will need to do to cultivate this reverential fear of God is a daily remembrance. Daily remembrance of your dispens disposability. If that's too difficult for you daily remembrance that you are disposable daily not once a week not once a year daily 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 that you are disposable daily the Christian worker is like toilet roll not like handkerchief you don't throw away handkerchief every day. But you throw away toilet roll. The moment you finish using it, you throw it off. Don't keep it with you. It's disposable. The Christian worker must know, like, they serve both purposes. They serve the same purpose. Handkerchief cleans your face. Toilet roll sometimes also cleans your face. And so when you use the toilet roll to clean your nose, you throw it off. That's you and me. And so, daily remembrance of your dis possibility will help you to always cultivate that reverential fear of God. Always. 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 When you remember God has people. So, you will, it will make you to fear Him. Who will not fear the God? Number four. To cultivate this thing I'm talking about. Number four. And this is important. In this place, uh, this number four, as we remember your replaceability and all that, number four, always. Always. And that's important. Always keep close to your Bible. Because when you read the Bible, you, as a preacher, not as a Christian now, as a minister, as a leader, you will not read far. Your, your, what you consider, for example, now, if a child of God is going to read that Revelation chapter 15, he's going to just be talking about what's eschatology. Eschatology, because it's an eschatology passage. A child of God will just be reading that passage for eschatology purposes, for, to learn, to, to learn about the end times. But you, servant of God, child of God, you read your Bible with a different eye. If you have not started that, start that. We are going far in the Lord now. How many years now? Many of us here have been in the Lord 10 years, 15 years. You ought to have a different eye when you are reading your Bible now. Your eye should not be the eye of what, is the, what this Bible passage usually talks about. Of course, we know that Revelation usually talks about the end times. But when you read the Bible, say, what is this thing speaking to me now? In my position now, in my place now. That is how to avoid stagnation in your Christian life. You read the Bible in a fresh way. The Holy Ghost teaches you, opens your eyes. When I read this, that Revelation 15, and I, and I read, it said, they sang the song of Moses. I said, what? Song of Moses. How did he teach there? No, he didn't teach there. How did they know it? We don't even have that song recorded anywhere in the Bible. But the Bible tells us it's the song of Moses. Maybe when Moses got to heaven, maybe he told those people, you know the, only, you know the reason I'm here now? I came early. 
even though I died at the age of 120. But uh, I should have gone beyond that because I wanted to enter Canaan. But God said, no. Why? He would have asked Moses, why are you here? Oh, it's because. I don't know whether I will be able to speak about it. Maybe he would have said, oh, let's forget that area. And then, the people will know because when we get to heaven, we will know everything. Okay. Who will not fear thee, O God? And glorify thy name. For thou only art holy. And he says, Hey, this man, when they got to heaven, those people, they began to sing that song to remind themselves that <laughs> fear God, fear God. Each time they sing that song, they remember, fear God. Fear, because they are closer to God than you are. You know, those who see God every day, those who approach his throne, those angels, those people in heaven, they see him, they stand before him, they put their crown before him, they talk to him, they approach him, they do everything. That's what happened to Lucifer. That's why he was cast out. When they see God every day, the closer you get to God, the more of this thing I'm talking about you should cultivate. And how do you cultivate it? Number four, I told you, always read your Bible. And don't read your Bible as a Christian. Read your Bible as a Christian servant of God. Servant of God. And then God will be telling you, this thing is not just the surface, surface, surface thing only. There is more to it than meets the eye. I round up as I take you back to that Revelation again. Chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 verse 3. In Revelation 15, 3, it says, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. I'm glad to tell you that even though God disciplined Moses, he was still the servant of God. That tells you that this fear I'm talking about is not the kind of fear of you commit sin, you commit sin that takes you to hell. No. He, God disciplined him, but he was still a servant of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. I listened to a preacher some time ago. He said he was in a church. He was trying to describe to the people about God. He was trying to describe God to people. He said all of a sudden, a realization came upon him. He fell on his knees before the whole church. He started to plead for mercy, saying, God, forgive me, trying to describe you to the people. A sense of God's greatness just fell upon him. The whole church began to tremble. That man fell on his knees. He began to plead for mercy. That, Look at me, mortal man, trying to describe God. How can I with these tongues of man, this tongue of clay, describe the great God? He said, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. The whole church was changed that day. Because a man was standing before them who recognized the greatness of God. Do you recognize the greatness of God? You know, we call him God, 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 God all the time. Do you know that God? If you don't know that God, you cannot really serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways. O King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O God? Hey, that question is not a question looking for an answer. It's just telling you that, who is there? Who will become so big, so great, so mighty, so high, so exalted, so familiar, so used to God, that he will not fear God and glorify his name. Praise upon the gospel.